Hi everybody, this is Dr. A and I have your third video in molecular and we are going to look at probe hybridization techniques in this video. So a nucleic acid probe is a short strand of DNA or RNA of a known sequence that is well characterized. So it's a sequence for a gene that we're looking for and it is complementary for the base sequence on the test target and that's the, the sequence we're trying to detect. The probes can be fragments of genomic nucleic acids that can be made from clone DNA or RNA or from synthetic DNA. In a hybridization reaction, the probe is what is detected. And the way we detect it then is that we label the probe. And so it can be labeled directly with a radionuclide, an enzyme, or biotin. Um, the enzyme has to be able to generate a colored reaction of some sort or a fluorescent reaction or a chemiluminescent reaction, and then that's what's detected. Um, biotin binds to avidin, and then avidin is usually bound to an enzyme, and then the enzyme is should be able to generate a color reaction, a fluorescent reaction, or a chemiluminescent reaction. Um, hybridization of the probe to the target DNA or RNA can take place in a solid support medium or in a solution. So this illustrates it. So we would have DNA in the sample. We would denature it so that it becomes single-stranded DNA. And then we would incubate it with labeled DNA probes that are looking for a gene of interest, which is all purple here. And uh, if the you know the gene is there, the probes are complementary to that gene, it will anneal, and uh, then everything else that's not hybridized or uh, you know non-anneal there will uh, be washed off, and then the probes are detected, present or absent and stuff. So that is the basic hybridization idea. So um, why do we use hybridization? Uh, and what's the application of hybridization probes? So we can use them to detect infectious organisms, to detect gene rearrangements and chromosomal translocations and breakage. This can be helpful, especially with cancers, uh, but also with genetic diseases. Uh, we can detect changes in awkward genes and tumor suppressor genes or factors. We can aid in prenatal diagnosis of an inherited disease or uh, detect a carrier status. We can use it to identify polymorphic markers used to establish identity or non-identity. So that would be like forensics, paternity, that kind of stuff. And it can also aid in donor selection for, um, you know, organ implants and stuff, transplants. So this is what a translocation is, in case you don't know. So you would have two... Um, basically chunks of uh, two different chromosomes that swap uh, location. And so that is a translocation and that happens a lot in cancers and stuff. And then uh, this is an example of the detection for a cancer gene, a proto-oncogene. Um, and so we're gonna look at some of these and how we can do those. Okay, so the solid support hybridization, um, we have first a dot blot hybridization. It is the simplest type of solid support hybridization. The clinical sample is applied directly onto a membrane surface. The membrane then is heated, which separates the DNA strand. So that's the denaturation step. Then the label probes are added, and then a wash step removes any of the unhybridized probes, and then the presence of the probes is detected, uh, either via the uh, audio radiography or um, the action of the enzymes that producing a color change or a fluorescent light or something like that. Uh, this one is a qualitative test only, so you only get positive or negative. It's there or it's not, all right? Uh, and it is subject to background interference, which makes weak positives hard to interpret. So here it is illustrated. So you have your sample, DNA is extracted. It is applied to uh, the nylon paper, so it's blotted on nylon paper in these little circles. It is denatured uh, by alkali. <clears throat> and then um, you have you add all the probes that are labeled, so you get probe hybridization, and uh, it will hybridize to the dots that have the gene of interest. The wash step removes any of the unhybridized probes, and then uh, the auto auto radiography in this case on X-ray film can detect uh, where the label probes are. 
Next, we have sandwich hybridization. So it is a modified dot blot to resolve the background problems. It uses two probes. One is mounted a membrane to capture the DNA, and the other anneals to a different site than the first probe, and it is labeled. So that is what is detected. Um, this means that the sample DNA is sandwiched between the capture probe and the signal probe. But if you understand the concept of a sandwich, normally sandwich is like this, like bread, bread, you know, meat in the middle, right? Well, in this one, it's actually more of an open face sandwich. You're going to see here, I've got an illustration. Um, this method does increase specificity, uh, and it often uses micro titer plates instead of membranes. Therefore, it's more easily automated. So here it is. We have the capture probe, so it can be on a well, and then the analyte of interest, the gene sequence of interest we're trying to detect on the DNA. And we incubate them together. The um, If it's there and complementary to the capture probe, then it would anneal to it and hang in there. And then we add the detection probe. And if uh, the detection probe is complementary to the rest of the sequence here, then it can go and anneal on that spot, the spot that's open. And then uh, the detection, uh, everything, well, everything that's unhybridized would be washed. And then uh, this part of the molecule uh, that is attached to the probe can you know, be detected via whatever you know, type of molecule it was. Um, and so you can see how with the probe, uh, with the capture probe and the detection probe being kind of side by side, it's, it's an open face sandwich and it's capturing uh, the analyte here that's going to be laying on top of the capture and uh, detection, detect probe. So next we have Southern Blot. It is called Southern Blot because it was developed by E.M. Southern. And then as we found different applications, they decided to go with the you know, names of the cardinal points. So then we have Southern, we have Northern, there's Western um, Blot. And so um, it is named after somebody that initially. So the... First step in Southern Blot is a DNA ex extraction from a sample using a phenolic reagent. Then the DNA is going to be digested by a restriction enzyme, a restriction endonuclease. This will produce DNA fragments. Um, the DNA fragments are then separated by agarose gel electrophoresis. Um, and then uh, those DNA fragments are denatured, so become single-stranded, and transferred into a nitrocellular membrane by capillary action of the salt solution or by an electric current to transfer the DNA to that uh, membrane. Uh, once the DNA has been transferred onto the membrane, the label probe is added. The probe will anneal to its complementary base sequence. This form visible bands on the membrane. The northern blot is the same process, but it is used for RNA. And so here it is uh, illustrated. So you've got your sample with, that's digested with the restriction uh, enzymes. It is loaded in the electrophoresis gel. Electrophoresis is applied. The um, sample migrates into these bands you know, with fragments precipitating out at different locations. Then it is transferred. This one is a capillary action transferred. Um, to the nitrocellulose membrane, and then uh, once it's transferred to the nitrocellulose membrane, it's incubated with radioactive probes. The probes will anneal uh, to their complementary sequences wherever they find them, and that will cause bands to be visible after um, the paper was exposed to x-ray film, and then you can see the bands on the x-ray film. So uh, the restriction fragment length polymorphism um, is kind of an application of that, but it helps evaluate the differences in genomic sequence to identify individuals in forensic or paternity testing or to identify a gene associated with the disease. So you get the DNA extraction and purification that usually comes from leukocytes, possibly followed by PCR to amplify the amount of DNA that's uh, present. And then you incubate it with endonucleases, uh, a specific restriction enzyme. And what it does is it will produce DNA fragments of different lengths that are unique to individuals. So where it cuts, the patterns of the where it can cut is unique. Uh, and so everybody gets a different pattern of uh, fragment lengths. 
and then you apply the southern block technique which we just explained and then this is um, similar to what you would see after you know the x-ray um, process has been done so next we're going to talk about the solution hybridization so the principle is that first both target nucleic acids and probes have to be free to interact in a reaction mixture uh, this results in an increased sensitivity compared to the solid support hybridization. It requires a smaller amount of sample. Um, and then second, the other requirement of solution hybridization is the probe must be single-stranded and must be incapable of self-annealing. So the probes can't bind to each other, anneal to each other. So this is an example of institute hybridization, a type of solution hybridization. First, you have the nuclease hybridization assay, also known as the S1 nuclease cutting assay. So the oligonucleotide analyte is captured onto the solid support, such as a 96-well plate, by a capture probe. So it ca captures it. Then uh, it is incubated with S1 nuclease. So um, S1 nuclease will degrade any single-stranded DNA or RNA into oligo or mononucleotides, and it leaves all the double-stranded DNA or RNA intact. So anything that got captured that has become double-stranded then is left alone, right? Uh, then the double-stranded DNA or double-stranded RNA then can be precipitated and detected. The hybridization protection assay, or HPA, the probe is labeled with acridium ester, which is chemiluminescent. Um, then you have the hybridization step, and then you have an alkaline hydrolysis to degrade the acridium ester um, of the unattached probes only. It cannot get to any probes that are already attached. And then um, the probes that are uh, bound then can emit light when the trigger is added. That trigger is hydrogen peroxide. The um, Dagene um, hybrid capture 2 assay for the detection of human papilloma virus is an example of another solution hybridization. It uses an antibody that's specific to the DNA RNA hybrids uh, to capture and detect them. The hybrids are made of one strand of the HPV DNA and a hybridized RNA probe, and then that is what is detected by the antibody. And then lastly, in in-situ hybridization, um, this is a hybridization that is done on cells, tissues, or chromosomes that have been fixed on the microscope slide. It uses heat denaturation of the slide to separate the DNA strands, and then incubation with a label probe to anneal, uh, and then the end product, product will generate either fluorescence or a color change, and then that's what's detected. So if you're looking for example, these are chromosomes. If you're looking for specific genes on a chromosome, uh, everywhere where the probe has annealed, there is fluorescence, and it can then show where the location of that gene or if that gene specifically is present on those chromosomes. This one is more uh, on cells. So anyway, that wraps up our hybridization video. And I have one more molecular video coming up on DNA sequencing and uh, microarrays and stuff. So. Stay tuned.